Well, it's, uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm very excited uh, to, to be part of this, uh, this summit. Uh, so I'm Jose Reyes. I'm a, the co-founder and chief technology officer of, of New Scale Power. Uh, and uh, I'll be serving as the moderator for our fireside chat. Uh, so it's, it's just a wonderful uh, opportunity to, to get to hear about how we're changing uh, ideas into reality. Uh, and I think you'll get a lot from this, this session as we ask each other some, some questions. Uh, but Doug Hunter will talk about the, uh, the first carbon-free power project uh, that will implement uh, small MOD reactors. Uh, and, and Shannon will talk about uh, the future of, of nuclear energy, uh, some of the, the advancements in design, uh, as well as the JUMP program, a joint use of modular uh, program. Very exciting. Uh, but I'll kick us off with this first slide. We each have one slide. And uh, this is the idea of uh, we're building a billion dollar company. Uh, it's a whole new industry. Uh, so uh, New Scale Power uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the company that, uh, that I helped uh, found uh, back in 2007. But it really relies a lot on, uh, on the, this collaboration between uh, private investment and the public partnership with the Department of Energy. So the whole thing started back in 2000. So I've been at this almost 20 years. So how hard is it to take something from the lab to the market? It's hard. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. Uh, so back in, uh, in 2000, we received a grant uh, while I was the, uh, 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 a professor at Oregon State University. I'm now a professor emeritus. Uh, and uh, that grant was to develop a new concept for a, a small modular reactor. And so and that work went on to, through about 2003 when we finished the work. But by the time we were finished, we actually had a one-third scale electrically heated prototype. And we found it worked remarkably well. Uh, in 2004, I spent one year on a sabbatical uh, working for the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency uh, in Vienna. And while I was there, I got to speak to many different uh, delegates from member states. And what I heard repeatedly was we need power and we need clean water. And so uh, when I came back to the states in 2005, entered a commercialization program, uh, we had this great concept uh, for a, a, a new small module reactor. Uh, and uh, by 2007, we had developed uh, three patents, uh, which became the basis for the intellectual property uh, to make us investment ready. Uh, in 2007, I co-founded uh, New Scale Power with Paul Lorenzini. Uh, so uh, that got us started. In uh, 2008, uh, we, we uh, approached the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and said we have this novel uh, design. It's a different approach to, uh, to deploying nuclear power. Uh, we want to uh, commercialize a 60 megawatt electric small modular reactor. Uh, and with a whole new level of safety, a whole new uh, approach to operation, and particularly construction. Uh, these would be manufactured in factories and delivered to the site uh, and then installed. So it's an installation uh, process as opposed to a, a, a construction process for the, for the modules. Uh, in uh, in uh, 2011, uh, Floor became our, uh, our lead investor, Floor Corporation. Uh, they're a strategic partner. They have a, a long-term view. And so we went from venture capital to, uh, to a strategic partner. Uh, and that's been a fantastic partnership. It's enabled us to move forward in a significant way. Uh, <clears throat> we've been working with the Department of Energy uh, since 2013 in earnest. Uh, we received a grant or a, a cooperative agreement with the DOE uh, for $226 million. And it was a matching grant program. So basically, for every dollar that the Department of Energy put in, private investors would match that. This, was a, this is a tremendous uh, 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 enabler. And so when I think of ARPA-E and, and the idea of, of, uh, of uh, moving forward and getting these, uh, these new concepts off the ground, it's absolutely essential uh, to have that kind of a public-private uh, partnership. Uh, so that was a huge grant for us that allowed us to move forward with our design certification application uh, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, and uh, we submitted our design certification application uh, back uh, in 2016, or beginning of 2017. Uh, we're now very close to finalizing that. Uh, it's been a long, uh, uh, long uh, haul <laughs> working forward uh, with this, with, uh, with, uh, this design and, and moving it forward in terms of regulatory space. It's different. We had to get the regulator familiar with our design. Uh, but by the end of this year, the technical review will be done, uh, phase four. Uh, by September of next year, we're scheduled, and we're still on schedule, knock on something, <laughs> Still on schedule uh, to get our final safety evaluation report. Uh, so that's huge. Uh, so this will be the first small module reactor uh, to, be, uh, to be certified in the, in the United States. So we're excited about that. Uh, but there's still work ahead. Uh, we uh, recently signed a contract with the BWXT in Lynchburg, Virginia, which uh, allows us to start the design for manufacture. 
Uh, so we're moving forward with that. Uh, and it's all part of this process. Uh, New Scale started with two people. Uh, we now have uh, six offices in the US. We're about 400 strong. Uh, we opened an office in London. Uh, and we're about $850 million into this project. Uh, the majority of that funding comes from private investment. Uh, so you'd think that'd be, uh, that'd be enough to get us uh, to the uh, finish line, but there's more ahead, as you can see on this, uh, this chart. Uh, by the time we're done, we will have expended about $1.4 billion uh, developing uh, this new technology, getting it licensed, and getting it ready for construction. Uh, so it's an enormous process. It's a, it's a very large pr uh, process. But again, it's the public-private partnership that's really making this work. Um, uh, Doug will be telling you a little bit about the, the, the carbon-free uh, power project, but as part of that, uh, they'll submit a construction operating license application uh, to the USNRC to get the approval for the site itself. Uh, the first site will be at the Idaho National Laboratory, uh, so we're really excited about being able, again, to work with, uh, with uh, INL and, and, the, uh, and the DOE uh, complex uh, and moving that forward. Uh, and then uh, we'll start the fabrications of our modules somewhere around 2022. Uh, breaking ground in 2022, 2023, uh, and getting that first uh, new scale plant uh, delivered. It's a 12 module plant uh, by 2026. Uh, so it's been exciting. Uh, we continue to move forward. We're on schedule. Uh, and uh, it's great to see something start with very small seeds, uh, very small, uh, uh, small uh, ideas growing and becoming something that's going to be a reality. And so, I just so I'm so pleased that I was invited to share this with you. Uh, but I think you'll find that this, uh, this is an exciting panel session. Our company, um, about 40% of our employees are under the age of 40. Uh, and we have brought this, uh, this, uh, uh, this spirit of, uh, of innovation within the company. Uh, I started the company with three patents. We now have 480 patents, either granted or pending in 20 countries. And that's because there's, there's, there's so much innovation going on within our company and so much excitement. And our mission is something that's much broader uh, than just uh, providing electricity. Uh, our mission is to provide electricity, uh, water, and heat to improve the quality of life for people around the world. And every one of our employees embraces that, and that's what's driving us forward to move this forward in a, in a very real way. So uh, that's kind of my introduction. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to, to Doug uh, to talk about the uh, Carbon Free Power Project. Thank you, Jose. Uh, good morning. Uh, so uh, we're the first utility uh, mover in the United States and possibly the world on the new scale power module. Uh, I bring that point up because first of a kind in the utility business is very difficult task to take on. But uh, the product that, as Jose just explained, uh, really does meet all the challenges that we foresee in the utility uh, market coming up. So I put a list of things up here. Uh, first of all, I, UAMPS, Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems, is uh, 47 different utilities out in the West and part of the United States and six different states. Um, the load growth has been relatively flat for utilities, even in the East and the Midwest. But this has uh, really been a concept of uh, energy efficiency, the recession that came through that we're coming out of, things of that nature that went on. And we do anticipate that load growth will be coming along uh, with energy efficiency. But that isn't really why we're doing it. It's really going to be replacing our carbon-based fuel generation uh, as it retires. Uh, the other thing that's going on, obviously, as everybody's well aware of, is greenhouse gas regulation. Now, the federal government, since uh, George W. Bush administration, uh, really hasn't moved very far in trying to uh, tackle that problem. But out here in the West, uh, four states have already passed legislation for 100% clean energy objectives, Washington, California, New Mexico, and Colorado. Uh, we serve in those states, so we have to be ready for these uh, complements. And the uh, New Scale Power Module actually uh, fulfills that with a high uh, portfolio full of renewables and storage, if you will. Uh, but uh, those renewables bring a problem uh, with them as well. It's the intermittent nature of their generation, even at utility scale. But more profound is the net metering concept. That is residents investing in their own energy production, and they just don't have the same rigor as a utility would have around the installation or the operation of those modules. And so we get things called, like, for instance, you've probably heard of the Southern California uh, 
uh, duck curve, if you will. That's also brought in another problem. That duck curve, if you're familiar with it, where you see a drop in demand in the morning hours when the sun is shining, and then an increase in demand as the afternoon moves along, is also uh, reminiscent or, uh, and predictive of what we call an inverted price curve. It used to be the highest prices in the utility business would be right around noon to about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, going on into the evening ramp. Now those prices are negative in the morning and at noon and coming up through things. That is, we're being paid to turn generation off to absorb the over-generation associated with uh, net metering that's coming out of this. And so that uh, ability to price into the afternoon and to be ready for that curve is something that's really coming along. Uh, also, is if not the most important aspect, is the reliability resilience associated with the system that we're used to. Everybody in here knows that the job of a utility is to keep the lights on and the beer cold. <laughs> and the minute we don't do that, we hear from the customer. That is the number one primary objective we work on. And frequency is the basis of that, so that we can stay at 60 cycles. With intermittent generation, especially wind, uh, we see a fluctuation in frequency constantly, and the inertia that's on the system right now, the large coal plants, nuclear plants, they hold that very well. But as we start to see these retire, we're going to have to replace them with something besides just batteries and electronics, if you will. Uh, the other thing is I think we'll be, uh, we could be prone to more outages than we've seen before because of this uh, system out there, and so we need a system that can uh, uh, pick up that power and bring it back online, which we're referring to as first responder power, and it's part of something that'll be in the JUMP program uh, that Shannon will be talking about to where we're looking at southeast Idaho as a regional grid that can be carried in terms of outages. Also in the West, we're lightly regulated. Uh, California is the only state that has a uh, regulated uh, independent system operator. They're looking at expanding that into the West and they've introduced a product called Energy and Balance. And this is a five minute look at the system with a 15 minute redispatch. So the ability to move resources quickly without wasting fuel comes uh, in, into play and it needs to be something that can be dispatched at the time we lose it. And finally, affordability. Uh, beyond just keeping the lights on and the beer cold, they like to have their power cheap. The customer doesn't like to see an increase in power costs out there, and so this new technology coming about, about has to fit in to a competitive uh, concept. And even though renewables are under uh, three cents a kilowatt hour right now onto the grid in the West coming out here, they, it's not a complete story. Where the new scale power module here, we have a complete story. We have the development costs in here, we have the construction costs, we have the operational costs, and we have the decommissioning costs. Uh, that is, cradle to grave is inside our price, which is in the uh, mid 50, 5 cent a kilowatt hour range. Very affordable, very competitive out here. You can't say that about uh, the renewables. It is not a life cycle uh, price right now. There's no, there's no disposal cost. These are based on 20, 10 to 20 year contracts. Uh, you know, uh, leave it or uh, use it and leave it. And uh, same with batteries. We don't have that and the same with wind. We have a wind farm and uh, we've had strikes, lightning strikes on our blades and trying to dispose of those blades in typical manners through landfills and things like that is very difficult. So we see that uh, the new scale power module brings that complete cycle into costs uh, for a long period of time, uh, upwards to 40 years is our levelized cost of energy. That, you know, I mean, let you take it. Thank you, Doug. Uh, so you've heard from some of my colleagues here about some of the challenges associated with nuclear technology as well as the opportunities for nuclear to serve as a primary source of clean energy as well as complementing other and enabling other energy sources. Nuclear energy systems of tomorrow embody a wealth of innovation and they're poised to come in various types and sizes as you can see in this rough graphic uh, in front of you. Even the currently operating nuclear plants that provide 19% of the electricity in the U.S. today have embraced inter innovation throughout the decades of their operation, adopting advanced fuels that allow for power up rates, water chemistry changes that improve overall performance, control room digitization, and diverse and flexible coping strategies, or the FLEX program that protects our plants under e extended loss of power events. That's just to name a few of the many innovations 
All these changes represent the continual adoption of advanced technologies that make our nuclear plants do their jobs even better every day. So now many of our plants are working to support the increased adoption of renewable generation technologies that can increase variability in the grid net demand, as Doug referred to. Some of these nuclear plants operate with what they refer to as advanced economic dispatch, varying their power to reduce output when renewable generation is high or net demand is low. Many of these plants now are, are looking to innovate even further and are beginning to evaluate the technical and the economic feasibility of redirecting excess thermal and energy as well as electricity to the production of other needed commodities. This could be desalination of brackish water in the southwest, production of hydrogen from water electrolysis in the Midwest to support fertilizer production or steel manufacturing, or the production of hydrogen around the country to support the transportation sector through fuel cell vehicles. We're even looking at coal conversion to liquid fuels and other products. All of these processes allow us to inject even more clean energy into our daily lives, not just for electricity and electrification of processes, but also to support the thermal energy needs directly of these coupled industrial processes and to produce clean transportation fuels. However, if we just consider the large gigawatt scale nuclear plants that we're used to, we would miss many opportunities to provide dispatchable, clean energy and distributed energy systems that can be even more complementary to the evolving grid and to meet energy needs in remote, isolated microgrids. That's why technologies such as new scale small modular reactor and even smaller megawatt scale micro reactors that are under development by many private entities are so important. Many of these designs are cooled by water, gas, liquid metal, heat pipes, molten salt, uh, some of these operating at much higher temperatures and thus are able to more efficiently couple directly to meet the energy needs of many industrial processes. Many of these systems are being designed for manufacture in a factory with minimal site preparation needed such that they can be manufactured and shipped to site truck, rail, barge, even by plane with minimal site uh, readiness in order to operate within a very short period of time. Some of these designs are even being designed for mobile applications to meet the needs of our military forces such that they can operate in one location for a period of time and then be picked up and moved to another location where they're needed. We need to embrace these exciting new technologies as we think about and design the energy systems of the future. So Dr. Reyes uh, discussed the role of DOE in the early development of new scale technology and currently in the design certification process. And DOE are, and the national labs are continuing to work with new scale and UAMs, not only to accelerate the development and deployment of small modular reactors in the US, but other technologies as well to advance research and development activities through what's referred to as the joint use modular plant program that was mentioned earlier. Now the premise of JUMP is to enable both commercial use, power production, and research development and demonstration activities within a single multi-module plant, wherein one of those modules is dedicated to those research activities through a pre-arranged contractual agreement among the entities. So based at the INL site and coordinated with our partners here, JUMP will provide a very unique opportunity to conduct research within an operating commercial reactor environment, providing a relevant environment to demonstrate innovative nuclear technologies. And it will also allow us to demonstrate the use of nuclear technologies beyond the electric sector alone. This type of research is relevant across the board to so many different stakeholder entities to many DOE offices, including the Office of Nuclear Energy, ARPA-E, the Offices of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy and the Office of Electricity, as well as supporting the Department of Defense and the advancement of some of their micro-reactor programs that would support microgrid applications, the nuclear industry as a whole, as well as other energy producers and consumers. Government support in these early stages of demonstration and deployment of first-of-a-kind nuclear technologies is very critical to overcoming that investment risk to the development of these technologies. The JUMP program is just one aspect of such support for the deployment of both small modular reactors and micro reactors in the United States. 
If you go out and talk to those mini micro reactor developers, none of them have a, has a business case that looks at only electricity. It's looking at so many other applications that clean nuclear energy can support. So this program will support and spur near-term development of new technologies, and it will also enable the U.S. leadership in nuclear innovation and technology implementation. Now, some of the key research areas identified for implementation within the JUMP program include demonstrating that safe use of nuclear technology in hardened microgrids, the use of, energy, of nuclear energy to support multiple energy applications uh, for industrial processes and chemical processes, using a very flexible platform uh, that allows us to integrate one process and test it for a time before going to another process or testing them in parallel and using that energy as efficiently as possible. It also offers us a relevant test environment for advanced fuels and materials that might be fabricated using new manufacturing processes such as additive and other advanced manufacturing techniques. It also allows us to demonstrate and test a number of advanced instrumentation technologies and to install even more instrumentation into that research module to provide ample data for validation and verification of advanced modeling and simulation tools. We also have an opportunity to look at human factors aspects and cybersecurity approaches for multi-module and multi-purpose plants doing more than just electricity production, where these systems require so much more data transfer and communication between these interconnected subsystems than what our current plants currently do. And we'll also be able to operate or exercise our regulatory structure as we go through the approvals necessary to implement research in JUMP. We'll be exercising that regulatory structure in a way that we don't typically in order to go beyond traditional LWRs aimed at just electricity production. So successful implementation of this JUMP program and adoption of advanced technologies in commercial nuclear plants that range from megawatt to gigawatt scales will ensure that the U.S. maintains the leadership and influence in the broader international nuclear and clean energy communities as a whole. So I hope you are hearing the gist that there are so many exciting opportunities emerging for nuclear technologies and for energy systems in general that will support a sustainable energy future that provides us the reliability and resilience that Doug spoke to across all of our energy sectors. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. That's a, that was very, <laughs> very informative. <clears throat> uh, we, we have a few, a few minutes, and uh, hopefully I get to ask some of the questions that maybe you're thinking. Uh, there's a lot of innovators in the, in the uh, audience today. Uh, how, how could they uh, connect with either JUMP or with, uh, with uh, IES uh, to, to work on some of their concepts? Well, the Integrated Energy Systems Program, we work with many universities and other national laboratories, and I hope some of our collaborators are out in the room today. Uh, but there are many opportunities for universities to propose uh, new modeling and simulation approaches or to demonstrate uh, some of the technologies that might be used in integrated energy systems through our nuclear energy university programs. Uh, we also have a non-nuclear test laboratory that we're developing to use electric heating to demonstrate integration of nuclear energy generation with renewable technologies, with real-time digital simulators that represent the grid system that these would be interfacing with. We have hydrogen production facilities in our laboratory. My hope is to make that a user facility approach where we can have many different researchers come in and demonstrate technologies, interface of technologies and control systems and then move out to demonstration with the nuclear plant within JUMP, which I also hope uh, to make into a user facility type of approach. So watch for many uh, opportunities on the horizon. If you have a new idea for something we can demonstrate within integrated systems, please catch me. I'd love to talk to you about it. Great. Yeah, I, I know I've had at least one person contact me with regards to the testing out some new fuel in yeah. one of the JUMP modules. Great. So this next question, I'll ask Doug. Uh, so uh, currently, how many members are, are participating in the Carbon Free Power Project? Uh, well, we have 34 utilities, both, uh, mainly municipal-based uh, utilities, but also rural electric cooperatives. And uh, they cover uh, Idaho, uh, Wyoming, Utah, uh, New Mexico, and uh, looks like we're going to be in Washington and Oregon soon, too. So. Great, great. And uh, has that required a lot of community outreach? Yeah, we've had, uh, as to date, uh, we probably had over 140 public meetings on this. Wow. I think that's really an important concept to get across uh, 
New Healer doesn't have you know, great PR, if you will, from my perspective out there. And uh, to be able to go out into communities and have an open meeting and discuss their, uh, their fears, if you will, or their concerns has really helped uh, bring this into the mainstream. Oh, fantastic, yeah. Well, one of the things that, uh, that we're working on at New Scale right now is this whole idea of, uh, of uh, designing uh, nuclear plants for climate adaptation. Uh, every year, I look at the, uh, the, the targets uh, in terms of, uh, of CO2 emission, and you see it creeping up, the, the concentrations creeping up. Uh, so you start thinking, at, at what point now do we start planning uh, for increased severe weather events? Uh, and so uh, one of the uh, things, I'll be speaking in Vienna on this topic, is uh, the idea of climate adaptation and what should new uh, power plants look like in order to respond to increase, increases in severe weather. Uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, and things like that. So we are we uh, have a, a program where we've uh, we've hardened our plants. Uh, this is part of the the uh, the, the design uh, aspect of, of what we're doing, uh, which includes the ability to, to have off grid operation, which is absolutely new uh, for nuclear power. Uh, right now, when you think of nuclear power, uh, typically if you have a hurricane come through, you get disconnected from the grid. Uh, you need to be able to get power restored in order to continue. Uh, operating your, your plant or your safety systems. In this design, uh, we don't require any uh, AC or DC power. Uh, we don't require any operator action or computer action. Uh, and we don't need to, uh, to keep the plant shut down and safe. And we don't need to add water uh, and, uh, to obtain an uh, unlimited period of, of cooling. So it really reflects a different level of, of uh, passive safety uh, being uh, developed. As a result of that, uh, this design doesn't need to be connected to the grid to maintain plant safety. In fact, we can become, and, and Doug mentioned this, first responder power. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, we can, uh, one module can power the rest of the plant, all the, uh, the remaining 11 modules in a plant, uh, and as a result, you become an island, and you're in island mode. Uh, and uh, you can be in a, an operational standby condition. So as soon as the grid is restored, you can start dispatching power in 60 megawatt increments to the grid. So this is a very innovative approach to, uh, to, to the grid and adding resilience and reliability to the grid. And so we're excited about that. Uh, but part of it, uh, the, the JUMP program will help us assess many of those features uh, and enable us to roll that out in a, to a much broader uh, community. So this has been a great panel. Uh, did you have a? Yeah, I do have a question. And, uh, so I get this question all the time, Jose, is why, I, uh, why shouldn't I wait for the more advanced reactors that could be safer, maybe cheaper, so on and so forth, than light water reactors, if you will. Yeah. Uh, the, question, the answer I usually give them is, uh, relates to uh, what it took New Scale to get ready to make an application before the NRC. Could you maybe hi highlight that a little there was bit? A, there was a lot of work. So we, uh, you know, we started an interaction with the NRC in 2008 and submit our application in 2016. So the eight years of pre-application. Uh, when you introduce a new design, the, the regulator has to have a way of licensing that. So they need to develop the regulations uh, that, that, that they'll, they'll be licensed by uh, to determine whether that design is safe or not. And so part of it is a huge testing program. Uh, we spent about $100 million in tests, uh, thermal hydraulic tests, critical heat flux, uh, control rod drives, all these tests have been completed have been submitted uh, to the NRC as part of that application. Uh, so there's a lot of upfront work that has to happen in order to move a technology forward. And it really requires this government, like DOE, uh, private partnership, and of course, a, a very dedicated customer like, uh, like UM. Well, with that, I think we're, we're out of time. Uh, so please uh, give our speakers a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>